Have you ever thought about what it would be like communicating with a loved one who's crossed over? Or how about running the concessions on the most popular Broadway show in the history of the theater? This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys Radio. And this week, my special guest is Mike Anthony. He's written a book on both. We've also got wilderness trekker J.R. Harris. We're going to talk about his treks all across America and all around the world. It all starts on KCAA at 8 p.m. Pacific time here in Southern California. 102.3, 106.5 FM, 1050 AM, the podcast and my YouTube drop tomorrow. Guys, guys, radio. Thanks for your support. He's, uh, he's got two things going for him. He's got two different books on two very different subjects. His name is Mike Anthony. He's a New Yorker like myself, and uh, he's a professional actor, and he's also a bartender who's uh, run the concessions for uh, Hamilton and its a uh, heroic run of a couple of years on Broadway. And I guess the movie's coming out this year of one of the performances, I believe. So he's written a book about that called Life at Hamilton. And he also has another book called uh, Love Dad. And it's about uh, the relationship that uh, my guest had with his father who suddenly passed. And then they made a connection after passing. And my guest, uh, Mike, has... Uh, He's very scientifically oriented, so he did a lot of checks to uh, see if he could find the proof of what was going on there. And uh, a lot of uh, epiphanies happened, a lot of interesting communication happened between him and his dad. And it's just a story I think anybody can relate to. So my guest is Mike Anthony. Uh, welcome to Guys Guys Radio. How you doing, Mike? Hi, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, let's start first on your book about your dad, because... Uh, my dad passed about three years ago, and uh, every once in a while he contacts me through my wife, and she'll come over and tell me, your dad said this or that. And so I'm, I'm very open-minded about uh, contacting people who have passed over because I feel it's all about frequency and energy, and I don't think that's the end. But that's me, and a lot of people, like yourself, are very skeptical. So when what happened when your dad passed suddenly, and then you got a call from somebody, a friend of the family, and they had a message that sounded like it was from your dad. And then you had a medium come over to your house. And then everybody was like, wow, what's going on? And then from there, you took your journey with other mediums going deeper and deeper into this exploration that finally led you to a part in the Surviving Death series on Netflix. So let's start at the beginning and we'll take it from there. Mike. Yeah, my dad uh, suddenly passed away in 2011, and um, at that time, yeah, you know, I've always loved science, and science, mainstream science, says that when you die, you die. That when the brain stops receiving oxygen, you, uh, you what you think of as you is gone forever, um, and that was what I had learned in college and when I was studying science. Uh, and so when my dad passed, that idea floored me. You know, I went to, uh, went into a full-on existential crisis that if he could just be gone as though he had never existed, then what was the point of doing anything? And then, yeah, this crazy thing happened where a medium, someone who calls herself a medium, contacted my family to say that she had a message from my father saying that he had survived his death and he wanted us to know that he was okay. And that's what started this journey. Okay, so you invite her over your house and you have your family there and you being the doubting Thomas, so to speak, uh, had uh, told your dad through kind of intention, I guess, that if you're really there, that you wanna mention something specific that only I would know about. So tell us about what happened during that meeting with the medium. Yeah, it was actually not that medium, it was a different medium, but yeah, we had this okay. medium come, come to our house and uh, I said, Dad, if this is real, I want you to mention my hair. I said that my hair is very average, right? There's nothing about my hair that a, a stranger would walk in and say, oh, there's got to be a thing about this guy's hair. Totally unremarkable hair. I said, if you're really there, I need you to get this woman to mention my hair. So she starts doing the reading, and everything she's saying is, is incredibly accurate in ways that I can't understand. She's saying things that aren't published on the internet anywhere, not in an in obituary. You know, it's really personal stuff. And I was blown away. And then at the end, as she's wrapping up to leave, she looks at me and she says, oh, he wants to talk about your hair. And I, I could not, you know, that totally changed my life, that one moment. So from there, you uh, still being somewhat of a skeptic, you wanted to really put this whole mediumship uh, concept to the test. So you brought in other mediums and you went through a similar process and it seemed like you were getting more and more uh, affirmative information that your dad was in uh, trying to contact you. 
And it seemed That's like true. being on the other side, he was one of the individuals that um, seemed to have an easier time getting through to people on this side. Yeah, you know, it, it, perhaps this is a talent like anything else. Maybe, maybe coming out of your body and then being able to communicate with mediums on this side is, is something like being a 300 uh, average baseball player. You know, maybe it's a talent. And it's, if it is, it seems like he's really good at it. So yeah, I then saw, you know, a few mediums in a row and all of them were get, doing the same thing, telling me stuff they couldn't possibly know. And then worried maybe that it was telepathy, that they were just reading our minds. I did another experiment where I told my mom uh, to think of, to talk to my dad and have him say something to us because she was not coming with us that day. And then the medium said all of these things and we understood all of them except this one thing. And when we called my mom after the reading, sure enough, that one thing was the thing that she had asked my dad to say. So it was it that ruled out telepathy. What was that that she uh, asked, that your dad she, asked her she was sitting on her porch drinking coffee with her sandals on and she looked down at her her foot and apparently my mom has a crooked toe which i didn't even know so she said okay robert which is my dad's name uh have the medium mention my crooked toe and and when we went there the medium, he he did he said does you, does someone have a bad toe uh and and yeah so that was another now, how, did, how did how did you feel uh knowing that you could still communicate with your dad Oh, it was incredible. It, it, it took me, my, my family was in incredible grief after he passed. I mean, we, we were devastated and didn't know how to move forward. And as soon as she said, he wants to talk about your hair, it was like someone had thrown a ladder down into a pit of despair that I was in and instantly yanked me out. You know, okay. that it was, yeah. All right. So you, uh, your uh, family found your dad in his office, kind of curled up. He died quickly, but peacefully. But he apparently he, his messaging when he came through was that he wanted to let everybody know that he was all right. Is that correct? <laughs> Yeah. Yep. You know, we, the, there were the messages that most mediums would say, he loves you. He's okay. You know, that's his main message that he's okay. But those were only meaningful because there are also these other evidential things that were said. Now, did you or any of your family members have any questions for him on the other side? Like, what are you doing? Where are you? Because uh, uh, the reason I ask that is, I think it's an obvious one, but also I remember when my, uh, when my aunt died, my mother's sister, and uh, she got cancer and she quickly died. And uh, one day, my mother, who's religious, but she's not spiritual, if you will, um, she had a dream. And she said, oh, your Aunt Claire, I dreamt about your Aunt Claire. And she pulled up and she was on the sleigh in the snow. And I asked her, where are you, Claire? Where are you? And she said, I'm everywhere. And that, that was just a dream. So she got some information from the other side there. What did your dad, if anything, tell you or has he told you about being on the other side? Yeah, the only information I got about that is actually also through a dream that I had myself through the mediums. Um, you know, the mediums are interpreting these feelings and images they're getting. So it's not like they're speaking in full sentences unless you go to a medium who channels, which we had. And these were mental mediums. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, but I did have this dream uh, where I was, it was unlike any other dream I'd ever had. And and I knew I was with him. And I was like, what do you do here, Tad? You know, what's a day like for you here on this side? And suddenly we were in this hospital wearing scrubs. And he told me that it's his job uh, to sort of help young souls who pass cross over, uh, which is something that I'd never thought about consciously before, the idea of what happens if a younger soul, a younger kid passes. But according to my dream, my dad somehow facilitates the crossing over of young, younger people. And I think, as you mentioned in the book, uh, that your dad had a pretty uh, peaceful, easy transition. Is that correct? Well, we, we don't know. That's what we've been told through mediums. Yeah. Okay. Again, like you said, it's found on the ground and it looked like it was very fast and mediums have confirmed that. Now, um, it's been a while now. So since the book came out, um, are you still in contact with your dad through dreams or any other way? And do you can you can say, hey, dad, I want to talk to you about something and you feel his presence or anything like that? Very strongly. I feel my dad literally behind, beside me right now. Yeah, I feel him daily. And he's very good at get, getting signs through as well. All kinds of crazy things have happened. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that all the mediums uh, said that you, they could feel the kindness that your dad was a really good guy. And that's that's mm -hmm. kind of a nice re affirmation of knowing that, you know, you were raised by somebody who's got a good heart like that. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, the, the last kind of the climax of the book is you went to one medium um, who uh, managed to kind of, uh, with a lack of a better word, kind of conjure up the actual presence 
of your father uh, physically there for a very brief period of time. What was that like, Mike? Yeah, yeah, this was something I hadn't known much about called physical mediumship. What we see on TV, like John Edward and the Long Island Medium, those are mental mediums. Physical mediumship is something where uh, the person supposedly produces this substance called ectoplasm, which I thought came from the movie Ghostbusters, but apparently not. It was a substance named by a Nobel Prize winner. And I'm sitting there in this room, and uh, you know, I know how crazy this sounds. I was sitting with a New York Times journalist when this happened. So everything you read in the book, she was sitting beside me. Her word is her livelihood. I'm telling you, this is the truth. Um, and my dad, I saw my dad's face form over this medium's face. Um, and talk to me. It was the most remarkable experience. Um, it's hard to describe in words. H has your dad um, provided guidance for you in any, any in, for any issues? Like, uh, um, you know, you ask him a question, how about this job or that job, or should I move here or there? Well, you know, kind of the big picture things. Has he, have you counseled him and has he, has he responded to you? He's counseled us, yeah, and he's actually given messages to us that did not make sense uh, at the time that they were given. And then as it turned out, he was uh, talking about something that was going to be happening in the future with regard to a jobs and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like I, I get his counsel uh, myself. But again, through mediums, it's, it's not like a, a conversation that you're having like you and I are having. Okay. Um... How did you then take your story, because you're not the first person to have this type of experience, and I say that respectfully, but how did you take it all the way to get on the Surviving uh, Death series on Netflix? Was that through your, uh, be, you know, being in the industry and just, you know, talking to the right people, or how, how did that all happen? No, oh, yeah. it was totally disconnected. Uh, I happened, I was making a documentary about that first medium that mentioned my hair. I was testing her and having her do readings for people on film. And Leslie Kane, who is the journalist who wrote the book Surviving Death that the Netflix series is based on, was in my film. Um, and Netflix decided to do that series while we were shooting. And she brought my story to them. And that's when they decided to use it in their series. Okay, with all your learnings, and Mike Anthony is my special guest on Guys Guys Radio. He's written two books, Love Dad, and we're going to get into his second one called Life at Hamilton. Um, but what what was your takeaway? So now that you you I, I'm going to make an assumption that you believe that uh, life goes on. It's just in, you're in a different frequency. So how has that affected how you live your life? Is this like YOLO now or what for you? <laughs> totally. I mean, it's it, it's added a levity to my entire life. You know, I I. Uh, the the knowledge and for me like you said it's not a hope it's now a knowledge that life does go on it makes this life even sweeter because we're we're also worried about death right it's always somewhere in the back of our minds and to not have that be such an acute worry makes everything feel better now do you do anything on your own in terms of uh enhancing and expanding your like i would call a spiritual enfoldment in, in a way you meditate you part of a group that does spiritual enfoldment do you uh you know, because I'll, I'll ask questions uh, uh, during a meditation, and uh, I, a lot of times I, I don't get the answer right then and there. But about an hour later, I'll be, oh, and it was the answer to the question I was asking, but it comes about kind of in a roundabout way. What's, mm -hmm. what's, your, what's been your experience in um, expanding your capacity for uh, spiritual connection and working with vibration and frequencies, and how do you use that and develop that? Yeah, me, um, meditation for me as well. I mean, and again, this is something I've probably just started to do more regularly in the last couple of years. Um, and I don't, I, I always doubt myself, you know, I'm, my brain constantly gets in the way. Got the um, brain chatter, right? Yes, yes. Um, but that said, it is starting to have an effect. I do, I, I think I scare myself sometimes. I get into this state and I feel like I'm almost vibrating a little bit and I get a little nervous uh, and then I kind of bring myself back. But um, yeah, it has opened up that part of my life. I've, I've, I've definitely accepted that uh, there's a, a reality to all of this, and I'm, I'm trying to do what I can to quiet the brain and really experience it. Okay. So Mike Anthony, my special guest, Love Dad, is this, uh, his current book, and again, he is part of the Surviving Death series on Netflix. Let's move to your other book, Mike. It's called Life at Hamilton. Sometimes it throw, you throw away your shot only to find your story. So Mike ran a concession stand where you get your liquid for refreshments at the breaks on Broadway, and he hit the jackpot because you were running it for Hamilton, which is probably 
probably the most famous Broadway show in history it's going to go down as, I mean, because it was so different. Well, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I did not see it in all my times in New York because it always seemed like, oh, I'll get around to seeing it. And then Lynn uh, Manuel Miranda left and I was like, oh, well, I'll wait. And it, I just never got around to it. So what is the magic of Hamilton? I ask myself that question all the time. What is it? And I, I think it has something to do with some spiritual vibrational thing that we can't really put our finger on. I mean, the music is amazing. Lynn is an actual genius. So the, you know, the, the, the way that he, his brain works is unlike the average brain. And the, you know, as soon as the show starts, you're, you're vibing with this music and the way that the story is told, um, the choreography is stunning. And it was just really a, a moment of capturing lightning in a bottle where it all came together. Now, uh, since you've been privy to see, uh, be there for so many shows and rehearsals, and uh, did you find that every performance was different? I'll give you an example. Like I've seen the Rolling Stones like 19 times and sometimes they're better than other times, but they're always great. It's like pizza or sex or whatever, you know, it's always great, but sometimes it's better than another time. So when you see Hamilton, we, could you, you know, were there differences in the performances? Were there ad libs going on? Was it, you know, was Lynn riffing and just was it a, a uh, was it a story that you kept evolving? The performance kept evolving and it get tighter and tighter and then it would go off in a direction and come back. And you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. That's the magic for me of live theater is that you never see the same show twice, right? It's always somewhat different, um, even if it's the exact same actors, because they're human beings and they're having they're a different day today than they had yesterday. So there are always these slight differences. Yeah, not a lot of ad libbing, libbing in Hamilton because it's so um, fast, you know, uh, and y you can't get lost, you know, in those words are so specific. So you don't get a lot of ad libbing, libbing unless a mistake has been made, but it's definitely a brand new show every performance. What, what do you think, Mike? What is, if somebody asks you, what's Hamilton about? Uh, you know, obviously it's about Alexander Hamilton, but what's really about, what is the core message of the show? Well, it's about the struggle for democracy. It's about a guy trying to find his place in the universe, which we're all doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, it's about uh, what you leave the world with when you do leave. Um, you know, who writes your story and what will your story be? Those are sort of the main, that's really what it's about, a guy finding his place in the world. Now, when you run the concession stands and people have a short amount of time, a little window to get a drink and get back to their seat or whatever, you see the real people. It's like when you play golf, you can tell somebody's real personality sometimes right. by how they behave or softball. I know you're on the softball team for Hamilton. So uh, what was your, what's been your takeaway being behind the concession stand running that business about people? Because you've seen a lot of famous people. You have a f very funny story about Julie, <laughs> Rudolph Giuliani kind of yeah. cutting, trying to cut the line and getting busted on it by one of your fellow uh, uh, employees. And then uh, you've got the Mike Pence show, of course, where, you know, the, uh, the, the cast spoke to him. And, you know, I, I always ask myself, why did he even go to that show? He, he was just asking for it. What were your thoughts about Mike Pence being there? Yeah, that, I asked myself that same question. What's this guy doing here? Especially at that time, it was only like 10 days after the election. So everyone is still um, kind of reeling from the surprise. Uh, yeah, that I write a lot about what that night was like. It was an extraordinary, one of the most electric nights of theater that I've ever had because when he walked into the house, the lights were still up. So everyone suddenly knew he was uh. there. So then it, it, the show took on this meta aspect and the audience's reactions to every line in the show were very directed at Mike Pence and it was just electric. It g gave me chills. Amazing. So uh, you had some really cool celebrity customers also, uh, people with big hearts who could uh, who could relate to the, the work that people do who, who are not on the stage but who work in the theater business and bartenders and waitresses and waiters and all that. Amy Schumer comes to mind that she was so generous in her tipping um, why do you think that is? Was she she used to be a bartender or a, a waitress she, or? She was a bartender, yeah, back in the day. She yeah, and she's a tremendously sweet woman. She came to the show three times, tipped uh, seventy five dollars on one drink the first time. Then she tipped a thousand dollars, and the next time two thousand dollars. Yikes. Yeah, yeah, she's, you know, she's a really true, and not only that, the first time she spent like 15 minutes with us after she had gone to the bathroom, and she's just a truly lovely woman. 
Now, Mike, did you come up with some Hamilton skewed cocktails based on you know, that time in history, what people drank then or, or any type of other themes? They're all named, you know, we have like the Founders Fizz, which is really just a classic gin fizz that they might have been drinking back at that time. And then we have a, a Manhattan, a bourbon Manhattan uh, for Aaron Burr. Um, so, yeah, they're all that's our little gimmick is naming the drinks. You know, they're all they're classic recipes. We just give them names associated with the show. You know, it was interesting. I was at the, uh, you know, that that break is very important. So I was at I went to see David Bowie in the in the Elephant Man. Mm. And, and I was sitting there and after the show started, somebody kind of this guy came kind of ambling down the aisle and he was with a very pretty blonde. And they rolled they rolled into the about two seats in front of me. And it was Keith Richards and Patty Hanson. Wow. And this was this was back in the day, back like in the maybe the early 90s or something. So I got up uh, right before the break and I went to get a drink and I'm standing there. And who comes and stands next to me? The, just the two of us. Nobody else out there. Keith Richards. So wow. it's like my hero right there. So I said, hi, Keith, how are you? He goes, how are you doing, man? And I didn't <laughs> have, to, we had a you know, short conversation, but what was so interesting is that across the hall was Patty Hansen and she was swarmed by young girls because at the time she was a big deal model. She was in her, you know, at yeah. the Vogue heyday. And it was just interesting because here, I got Keith Richards to myself and, right. uh, all the young girls have the have the model over there. But, right. <laughs> uh, he was uh, he was very gracious, very nice, friendly, no no attitude whatsoever. And I guess you know when you deal with celebrities all the time, you find some people who are real and you some people who are not real. So who's been kind of like the coolest person you've dealt with in show business? Uh, one of the greatest guys. Uh, do you know Mark Ruffalo? He's an actor. I know who he is. Sure. Yeah, he was um, the, what you're talking about. That sort of the you could just tell that he was a genuine true guy like what i what he what i was getting is who mark ruffalo is um and he's also like a big activist he has a lot of great causes he was a lovely guy i mean almost everybody has been you know phenomenal Me meeting barack obama was probably for me one of the most uh, fascinating and then i met sports heroes you know like when i was a kid growing up i was a big red sox fan i know you're probably a yankees fan yes yes yep so I met, you know, Derek Jeter I got to meet and Dave Winfield, who, who sure. I loved when I was a kid. Um, yeah, meeting meeting those childhood sort of uh, idols was, you know, so much fun. Now, do you think, uh, well, first of all, uh, for Hamilton, it's, it's coming, the movie's coming out this summer, right? And is it a performance or what's going on with that? Uh, I think what you're thinking of is In the Heights, which is the other Lin-Manuel Miranda show. Okay. That's going to be a movie. Uh, on Disney Plus right now, there's a performance of Hamilton. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And are they planning to do a movie for Hamilton? Not at the moment. Uh, it's not, not at the moment, but you never know. You never know. Okay. And uh, what's next for you, Mike? Uh, you know, we're looking to come because we're shut down, obviously, sure. on Broadway now. We're, we're hoping to come back sometime. Um, you know, people are whispering about July 4th as a possibility. Um, but in between that, I'm working on the, uh, a documentary, uh, again, about um, the, the survival of consciousness beyond death. Mm -hmm. And have you been back to New York City often throughout the pandemic or have you kind of stayed to kind of stay up in Connecticut and do remote I, I've been holed up in, in Connecticut. Yeah, New, New York City, it's bizarre. I mean, if you went now, it's a ghost town in Times Square. It, it, it feels like you're in an apocalyptic movie. It's so strange. Wow, sad. Anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. so listen, yeah, I think you're terrific. And I, I love the fact that you wrote two very different books. I hope you keep going with that. Um, where can people learn more about you and your story, Mike, and uh, you know, catch more information about you? Uh, MikeAnthony.com. Everything's at MikeAnthony.com, and the books are available on uh, Amazon.com. Fantastic. Well, listen, you're a real guys guy. Thanks for being on Guys Guys Radio, even though you're a Red Sox fan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, Guys Guys Radio. We've got a, another terrific guest today. His name is J.R. Ha Harris, and he's a he's a real guys guy for sure. This is a gentleman who has traveled worldwide, trekking everywhere on his own uh, with a backpack. He started out with a Volkswagen bus and he just has an amazing story to tell. He's got a book out about his uh, travels and uh, the name of that is Way Out There. And uh, JR is gracing us today um, after a career 
of traveling and also a corporate career. So he's a pretty interesting guy. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's still active and enthusiastic trekker. He was elected to the uh, Explorers Club back in 1993. He's also founder and president of JRH Marketing Services and uh, the oldest and most experienced African-American owned research and consulting firm in the US. And he still lives in good old my hometown, New York City. So welcome to Guys Guys Radio, J.R. Harris. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. So I got to tell you, reading your book, I was just chapter after chapter, I got blown away by it. But I guess my first question is, you know, wh why? You know, I know you were a Boy Scout. You picked up a couple of skills there along the way. But why did you suddenly say, hey, I'm going to go drive to the tip of Alaska, circle Alaska, because I want my vehicle to be the most northernmost vehicle on the, on the, on the continent. In the Western Hemisphere. Right? <laughs> So what, how'd, you, how'd you get that, that going for you? Uh, well, it sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> the time was uh, back in 1966, back in the Stone Age. Uh, and um, the end of the northernmost um, road that you could drive in was, uh, was in northern Alaska, 120 miles north of Fairbanks. And um, it just seemed like a good idea. I had just graduated from college. And uh, before I kind of hunkered down to a job and a career and a wife and family and all that, uh, I wanted to just get away and do something exciting. And uh, I had an old beat up, as you say, an old beat up Volkswagen and, a, and a, you know, a, a half a handful of money. <laughs> and I just took off. You know, it's am amazing. I, uh... One uh, spring break, three guys, three of us out in Villanova University, we, we drove down with one car was four guys and they had a Plymouth Duster, which was a clean ride at the time. And we got stuck in the Volkswagen Beetle and we went all the way down to Fort Lauderdale and between the three of us. And it was so uncomfortable. You could never find the right position to sleep in, even if you put the front seats back. And I, as soon as I saw that, that you were going to go across country in a Beetle, I'm like, he, he must have really had an uncomfortable time. And you got into that because you could never find the comfortable position to sleep in. You, you had a little tent you picked up at one of those Army Navy shops that we had all over the place in the city. And you really got your butt kicked in that first trip, but it was a fascinating chapter in your book. Tell us a little bit about you know, what you learned during that first trip? Well, I, uh, I learned that I should be better at planning trips <laughs> instead of just taking off, uh, you know, right off the bat. Um, but more than that, you know, it was, it was a rite of passage. And um, I, I not only learned about geography and different people living in different, I'd never been out of uh, the United States before, so I drove across Canada. Um, and I, I, what I really learned most was more about myself, you know, who I am, how I handle adversity, uh, what kind of a person, um, you know, I want to be and, and what kinds of things are, are, are special and important to me. One of which is that I was extremely curious and realized that on this trip and that for the rest of my life, I just wanted to travel around the world uh, and see what was there, see what I could learn. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Oh, it's amazing. And that was back in 66. And for the benefit of uh, listeners, uh, he was Circle Alaska. And then the next trip he writes about is 20 years later, 1986. And he took that with a buddy of his named Pep, who uh, unfortunately passed away right after that trip. And then he was in up in a national park in the IU... Ayuito. Ayuito. National Park in Canada, Tasmania, Montana, another area in Canada, Switzerland, uh, Australia, and Peru. And those are the ones you just highlighted in the book. Um, why did you choose those locations to write about? Were they the ones that really stood out or was that the breadth of your trekking, your major treks? Well, um, I've been on 50 or more treks of two weeks or longer uh, all over the world. And so I had plenty of, of uh, trips to choose from. Uh, and I picked these in particular uh, because they showed a range of all of the trips. You know, there were some that I, most that I did alone, but some that I did with friends. They were on different um, continents. Uh, there were different issues involved, you know, one involving fear, one involving people helping out. Uh, 
learning about indigenous people, you know, and so they were kind of um, uh, a sample of all of the uh, of all the trips that I've been on so far. Now, how did you weave that in with your corporate career? Because you're very successful corporate career. You worked for big corporations like Pepsi, and I know that's a high powered um, uh, culture, if you will. And uh, then you set up your own research company. How, how did you manage to weave that together with all your travels? Because when you go on these trips, you, it was at least two weeks every trip, right? Yeah, at least two weeks, sometimes more than a month. Um, and because uh, I was in the wilderness, there was no way that I could even contact my office while I was gone in most of the early trips. Uh, it was before satellite phones and GPS and all that. But the way I was able to do it is um, I had a partner um, and who was my younger brother, my kid brother. And uh, when I started the business, he was just coming out of um, college. He, he had a uh, degree in Harvard. He never worked uh, in marketing before. And uh, since, since a kid brother's main job is to make their older brother happy, <laughs> uh, what he did is, you know, he was able to mine the store, so to speak, uh, while I would disappear. And, and I never had to worry about what was going on. Okay. I mean, he was totally capable. And then when I got back, then he could disappear and I could, I could uh, cover for him. Cool. So so how, how did you, uh, JR, how did you choose your destinations? Was it a combination of, you know, just the research that you did on your own, speaking with friends? Um, you know, because it's really kind of a, I know there was a process to it but there's a randomness to it also that makes it kind of nice that's organic because it is a romantic, if you will, type of uh, hobby to have to really be a world trekker. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, selecting the destinations, uh, it was a mishmash. You know, for example, I would, I would watch a, a program on Discovery Channel about the caribou migration. And most people would say, oh, that's cool. Now I know a lot about caribou. I looked at it and I said, you know, I got to go up there. I want to see that on my own. And then I, so I went up, you know, and then I saw it. Or, you know, I'd read a, a book or an article about um, Aborigines. And I said, you know, maybe I should just um, go down to the Australian outback and, and see for myself what it's like there. So it could be somebody mentioning a location or something, or I could read a book or on TV, whatever. Uh, if it grabbed my curiosity, that was it. Mm -hmm. I was going to figure out how to get there and just go there. Okay. Uh, guys, guys, radio, my special guest is world trekker, J.R. Harris. We're talking about his book, Way Out There, and we're talking about his travels and his incredibly interesting life. Um, so when you were out there, I guess on your own, you're a New Yorker, a lot of people in New York carry guns. When you were out there, you really didn't want to be somebody with, that had guns. And I don't know if you did too much with bow and arrows or fishing or whatever. How did you protect yourself? Or did you, did you think about that? Well, I thought about it, uh, but I, I did not carry a weapon. Um, the biggest thing I had was a Swiss army knife. And I used it mostly to cut my cheese. You know, <laughs> when I had my lunch. Uh, I, um, I was confident enough that I, I could go out there and be comfortable uh, without being uh, armed. Um, I knew how to live in grizzly country uh, or, you know, any place else, you know, I, I, I knew how to take care of myself if like I had a poison snake bite, for example. Um, and so I, uh, uh, I, I never really worried about it. And, and in all my trips, I never really had a problem either. Well, for food, Larry, uh, excuse me, yeah. JR, uh, did you ever have to kill an animal or go fish, catch something to, you know, to eat when you were running low on supplies? I know you always kind of packed your goodie bags with you, but. No, I, um, I, I didn't want to have to hunt or forage or fish mm -hmm. or anything. My thing is this, when I get hungry, I just want to reach into my pack and pull something out and eat it. There you go. So uh, it meant carrying, you know, some extra weight of course, I, I did have some fishing line in case, you know, of an emergency, uh, if I had to uh, find some food. But uh, essentially, I, I plan to carry enough that I, uh, I wouldn't have to um, start searching for food or, or anything like that. 
what, in all your travels, what did you learn uh, about people in general and about yourself? Yeah, good question. Uh, you know, I learned that that is probably more similarity among people than there are differences. You know, the, of all the people that I met in all the different continents and all over all these years, uh, it, it occurs to me that most of them want the same thing I want. You know, they want to raise their family. They want peace. They want to be able to feed their kids, you know, hug their grandkids. Uh, they want their um, offspring to be better off than they were. And um, I, I think because I, I was mostly alone, it made it easier for people to accept me, to uh, feel comfortable that I was there. They also liked the idea that I didn't represent any government. I didn't represent any uh, university. I wasn't trying to uh, um, interview them or examine them like they were under a microscope or anything like that. And they were very, very um, uh, impressed that somebody would come all the way from New York City for a simple reason to learn how they live and to see how they are. They, people couldn't believe it at first. They were saying, where are you coming from? What are you doing here? You know, and I would tell them. And uh, they were saying, you mean you came all the way just because you're interested in us? And I said, yes. And everybody told me the same thing from the mountains of Peru to the Amazon jungle, uh, Eskimo, Inuit, Laplanders. They all say, listen, you know, our culture is dying. The kids don't want to stay here. Nobody's learning the language. Nobody's learning the skills. And yet you came out here you know, on your own dime, you know, uh, just to just to learn who we are. And they, they really liked it. And, and I've made some very, very dear friends in faraway places over all these years. That's fantastic to hear. Um, you mentioned, uh, JR, that uh, fear, and it came up in one chapter. Could you tell us a little bit about, because you, you, frankly, you're pretty fearless. Uh, you had an, you have an adventurous spirit and you have a, um, I think a good outlook on mankind. And uh, I agree with you completely. People are people. It's, a, you know, environmental circumstances may change how different people behave at different times. We all understand that, but you, you, you went out there on your own. And as an uh, African-American, you know, that's, that's even more gutsy in my opinion, because you're gonna get, I, I assume you would have gotten some of like, hey, you're the representative of all black people in the world because you're black and you're here. And that you mentioned that in the book. But when when were you afraid when you were out there? Well, to be honest, I've been afraid a lot. Uh, in fact, I've been afraid so many times. I'm an expert on fear. If they had a PhD in fear, I'd be doctor scared. Mm -hmm. I, you know, but I what I've really learned about fear was to not be afraid of being afraid. You know, um, if, you, uh, if you face fear, if you can accept fear, then you're gonna be okay when something happens. And the, the more uh, often I was in a scary situation, the less fearful I would be about it happening again. Um, and so there's kind of a, uh, uh, a learning component about being afraid. And, and that is that uh, uh, it's gonna happen, just deal with it. Don't be afraid of being afraid. And um, what happens is after a while you begin to trust your instincts and then things get um, quite a bit better as far as fear is concerned. So I'm not afraid to be afraid. Okay, good answer. Um, do, you, um, do you consider yourself like a, a, a spiritual person? Do you meditate or just do any type of spiritual protocols? It seems to me, you're definitely a spiritual, spiritual person, person based on your experience and based on the fact that you trekked out there all these places on your own. But how do you see yourself that way? Well, I, I, I believe I'm a spiritual person. Uh, I don't know if I would call myself a religious person but I've certainly spent enough time on my own in really isolated um, uh, locations to kind of appreciate, you know, the vastness of nature and how the environment, is, there's a certain order uh, and a certain symmetry uh, involved. And that, you know, people are, are just, you know, a small part of a much larger uh, universe. 
And it's taught me humility. You know, it's taught me that we all have a certain place here and that we need to respect um, each other and wildlife and preserve the environment. So yeah, it's, you know, I've had plenty of time to think about it. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and, and that's one of the things I like about being alone. You know, you, you have time to uh, consider, you know, who you are and what your place is, you know, in life. That's, that's also awesome answer. You're very self-aware and you're comfortable in your own skin. And that's, that's a really good thing. And so many people are filled with anxiety these days. How, how did you, JR, stay in shape? Do you do any kind of exercise to get in shape before you go on one of these long treks? Because you have to hike many days and you have to cho also choosing the right footwear and things like that. What's your philosophy on that? Well, essentially, um, if you want to... Uh, travel like I travel, and you want to really satisfy your curiosity, uh, it's imperative that you are in good physical shape. Um, the fact that I go alone, there's no help, if anything happens, um, I have to really depend on the fact that I can, uh, I can carry the weight I need, um, and that my body's in good enough shape to, um, to be able to not only do it, but to have fun out there, to enjoy it, and, and not to worry. And so, uh, because I, I love trekking so much, um, it's become very easy for me to stay in shape. So it's a, it's a year round process. Um, you know, I'm, I'm diligent about getting my exercise. Uh, in fact, this morning, I, I've already played uh, three sets of tennis, there you go. Uh, which I love to do. And, awesome. that, and that's it. I just you stay in shape. You know, I'm a, uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, I'll be 77 years old. Wow, and I'm you look still terrific. Trekking. You, you know, look terrific. Go out there. <laughs> so um, I, we talked about fear a little bit. I don't want to dwell on it, but I, I think I might have diverted the question a little bit. What was there an instance in all your tracks where you were, you know, generally really scared out of your wits? And what did you do? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, to pick one out, <clears throat> you know, here's a weird thing. Now, um, I've had uh, close encounters with grizzly bears with wolves, um, <clears throat> with uh, harsh weather, lightning, storm, you know, really threatening things. But the thing that scared me, I believe, more than anything else in my life was a trip that I uh, took to Tasmania, which is one of the trips in this book here. Mm -hmm. And I was alone in a really remote area in the mountains and in my tent, and I heard these strange noises at night. And it was something was out there close to my tent. And I could not imagine what it was because nobody lived there. There were no animals around. I, I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was something. And I knew it knew I was there. And I was sitting in my tent waiting for something catastrophic to reach in and grab me or whatever. <laughs> and I'm not going to tell you how that thing ended because it's in the book. Okay. All I can say is I survived. But, but I was never so scared in my life. And it turned out that I didn't really have to be as scared as I was. Awesome. Um, bucket list, any places you still looking forward to trekking to? Yes. Every place that I haven't been yet. Wow. <laughs> Every place on the planet. I had a, a couple of trips that were planned. One was to um, go into high Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the Berber people live there, and I'm very interested in people who live in remote areas. I'm a social scientist by education. I have a degree in psychology, and I, I love to go and, and talk to people, especially the, the uh, elders, and sit around and listen to their stories. And uh, I had one, as I say, to the Atlas Mountains that COVID interrupted. Um, I also, you know, want to go to the Scottish Highlands, uh, Siberia. There are people up there that I like to see. I've been around the world, above the Arctic Circle, visiting communities up there from northern Alaska, northern Canada. I've been to Greenland, Iceland. I've been in Lapland and Norway and Sweden and Finland. So I've been all the way around the world, except for that piece in, uh, in Siberia. So. Maybe I'll get up there just to kind of mm. close the circle. There you go. Any advice for uh, kind of the newbies out there who want to get some trekking in? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, 
I, I heartily encourage everybody to get out and, and get outdoors, um, whether it's trekking or skiing or roller skating or just day hiking in a park uh, for the health benefits that are out there, um, mentally and physically and emotionally, it's really great. If you wanna be a real trekker, uh, I would say, yes, yeah, start out easy, you know, start out maybe just a day or two, um, learn how you are re relating to it and reacting to it, uh, gradually build up the, uh, the uh, gear that you need and, and you can make the trips increasingly more uh, uh, diverse and complicated and long and whatever, and, and just develop it over time uh, because you don't have to have a good time you don't have to be um, halfway around the world to have a good time. That's you know, just go where you want to go. And if you're a curious person, that's really the engine that drives exploration and travel. Got it. Well, J.R. Harris, I am so impressed with you as a human being, as a man, and for all of your uh, exploits and explorations. Really, uh, you're a real guy's guy, and I admire you. So thanks for being on the show. Where can people find out more about you, J.R., and get your book? Uh, well, the book is available at uh, any um, bookstore. Uh, it's also on Amazon. It's called Way Out There, Adventures of a Wilderness Trekker. Um, I'm also on Instagram at JR in the Wilderness. And I'm also uh, on Facebook, J. Robert Harris. I also have a website, okay. jrinthewilderness.com. And that website has some really nice uh, photos on there of campsites and, and uh landscapes and things like that. It's really nice. Fantastic. Well, listen, thanks so much for being on Guys Guys Radio. God bless and I uh, hope to see you again. Back at you, my man. Take care of yourself. Thanks right. again. Thank you.